Welcome into episode 117 of the Sources Say podcast, your go to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Happy to be joined once again by the one, the only, Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. Sean, how the heck are you? I'm great, Jack. How are you? I am doing better now that the re- recruiting momentum has continued and is continuing for the Kentucky basketball program as. Chris Livingston has announced his commitment to the University of Kentucky, choosing the Wildcats over uh, Memphis. We'll get into that in in a second. Uh, Tennessee State, the G League, and Kansas. Uh, Another massive, massive get for the program. Another top five prospect. Consensus top 12-ish prospect, depending on which recruiting service that you look at. Uh, Chris Livingston is uh, yet another massive get for the program, Sean, just one week after securing a commitment from Number one prospect, Shaden Sharp, Uh, and then we'll talk here in a little bit that there's also more buzz that Kentucky might not be done anytime soon, that they're also on the cusp of landing uh, one or two other uh, top high-profile prospects. So, Sean, things are going quite swimmingly for John Calipari and his staff right now. Um, Before we get into, you know, the X's and O's of what, you know, Chris Livingston is and what he brings to the – uh, what he brings to the table as a player. Sean, just what does it mean to go, uh, you know, two for two back-to-back weeks with top five prospects? It solidifies everything that we said a week ago, that John Calipari and this recruiting effort is back to what it used to be. It's back to doing what it used to do. And it, it's not, I mean, it's not getting low-end five stars. We're talking about guys at the top of the class. And, I mean, you're talking Shaden Sharp, who's the consensus number one player now across all rankings. I mean, you're, that's, that's the top of it. And then you follow it seven days later with Chris Livingston, another top five guy by 24 seven sports. They're back to doing what they were doing a long time ago, Jack, when you get into the fall, this is what Kentucky used to do string together commitments right before the season started, or they would either do it the week of signing day. It's been a while since they've been doing stuff like this with the elite of the elite. Now they would get really good players, these two dudes are program changers when you're looking at what they bring, their skill set, and the guys that they're targeting in a great position for. You're starting to think now, Jack, that this class, behind closed doors, it could be close to, to being about 90% complete, right? Until yes. they decide something with Derek Lively and, and later on. But the bulk of this thing, the work has been put in. The way that they've been going out on recruiting, sending Jay Lucas here, Cal going here, the energy and effort on the recruiting trail right now is unmatched. Yeah, absolutely. There, there was a little anxiousness, I think, from the Kentucky fan base about like, you know, all right, we got Orlando and Antigua. We, ha- we got Chen Coleman. You know, the Peach Jam happened. We got this, you know, recruiting buzz. But we're not getting the commitments to, you know, kind of solidify the, that momentum. We, we – you know, everybody's talking about, oh, UK is leading for Shaden Sharp. And everybody's like, well, he's not signed on the dotted line. You know, we got those same narratives before with, you know, the Jaden Hardys of the world and, you know, guys that were seen as longtime heavy, heavy, heavy UK favorites. And then, you know, you kind of penciled them into the class, but you couldn't officially pen them into the class because they weren't committed. They weren't signed, sealed and delivered. And, you know, at the end of the day, they would, you know, momentum would start trickling away and and start trending elsewhere and and UK would end up being you know left at the altar with with without those players in the past so I think I understand why there was a little bit of uneasiness on the on the you know Kentucky fan base's side of things where they were wanting to see the tangible evidence of this this coaching staff's true recruiting success and you got that with Shaden Sharp but even still that was like a you know, everybody kind of assumed that UK was the leader there for a long time, and and they they had been for a full calendar year, dating back to you know last win, winter. Um, you know, they were that was one thing, and, and it was a ma- massive get. But Sean, this was a massive recruiting win. This was they went up with you know the the Kansas of the world, the uh, you know Memphis, who has been just kind of the you know swaggy kid on campus right now lately. They've they have you know had a lot of this this recruiting momentum as of late and Cal went out and flat out beat beat the rest of the competition beat out the G League beat out Memphis and um, you know there there was a lot of talk about you know who cut ties with who and and I think there was like this kind of national buzz that Memphis was the one that cut ties with Chris and 
at the very end of the day, yes, Memphis did end up cutting ties because they knew that they were a hat on the table because Chris had chosen Kentucky behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So make no mistake about it. There is this narrative out there that like, Oh, Memphis just didn't want this kid anymore. I mean, literally three weeks ago, Chris Livingston was Memphis's biggest recruiting target in the class of 2022. He didn't just magically lose all of his basketball abilities. And they said, Ugh, we don't, we don't need a top five prospect in the class. That's not how it unfolded. They, they were the favorite in the past. The pro route was also a heavy favorite there for a minute. And Kentucky kept clawing, kept, you know, throwing, you know, jab after jab after jab. And they ended up winning at the end of the day. And, and that's where the, you know, it, it was the old Rick Barnes, I'm withdrawing my name from consideration uh, for head coaching jobs. That's, that's what ended up happening with Memphis. They were not the choice, so they said, we're not going to actively recruit you anymore, even though he wanted to be public re- publicly recruited. So at the end of the day, Chris Livingston is a Kentucky Wildcat, the third commitment in the class, joining Sky Clark, Shaden Sharp, and Chris Livingston. Uh, Sean, you've gotten a chance to watch his game a little bit, and, and you know we've talked behind the scenes about – you know, what he brings to the table as a player, uh, you know, like, let's, let's just talk about that for a second, give our, our individual scouting reports, what you've seen watching his film and, you know, what kind of what, what kind of on court impact he can make in Lexington. Yeah. I watched some tape right before we actually started recording. I was sitting here watching it with you and, and just telling you that his skill set fits what Cal's doing with him wanting to be a small ball for. Yes, or he can play the two or the three. His his shot has improved tremendously. I, I think his shot form is excellent. I told you it, it's it's amazing. Like when you watch his form, uh, but it's it's his body. It's his NBA ready body. It's his ability to finish in traffic. His ability to dunk on people. He's he's a matchup nightmare as a small ball four. When you factor in the other wing pieces, Kentucky's going to have in this group with the Shaden Sharps, the Sky Clarks. If they land a case in Wallace, there's there's options there on the wing. If you slide him to the four, he is a matchup nightmare. Like you, four men cannot match up with his skill set. He's good off the bounce. He has good handles. You've mentioned it a couple of times that he does have a tendency to take some bad shots. You know that that will that will be taken out of his game at Kentucky. That will not be a part of his game. John Calipari will not allow it, Jack. So that that's I'm not really worried about that part of his game. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and we talked about this on the last episode where if you listen to Coach Cal's words closely, you'll know that, you know, he, he is a mastermind whenever it comes to PR. Last season was the exception. It was the outlier. He had no idea how to deal with the, the adversities that came with last season. We talked about that. That was one of our biggest criticisms. But nine times out of ten, Cal knows exactly what to say and when to say it. He is a PR gold mine. And if you listen to his words closely, and I wrote a post on this on, on KSR, you know that he was publicly recruiting Chris Livingston or explaining how Chris would be used in Lexington without saying his name. I mean, if you go down the list, he was on, he had a public, you know, media press conference with, I believe it was Monday or, or Tuesday, whatever, whatever it was. And then he, I think it was Wednesday and then, Thursday, he joined KSR, and he basically said a lot of the same things. But his message was, I have the quotes pulled up, we're going to have four positions that are guard positions. That doesn't mean I'm starting four guards, but if you want to be in one of those four positions, you're going to have to have guard skills. And if you don't have guard skills, you're going to be playing as one of our bigs. That was a quote to the media. And then the next day, talking to KSR, the reality, this, is, this is easily the biggest one. This is, tell me – Tell me he's not talking about Chris Livingston publicly here. The reality of it is the perimeter players have to have guard skills. If you're big and you have guard skills, that's even better. You're going to defend. You're going to have to be tough. If you do those things, you can be a perimeter player. It's where the game is going. That is literally Chris Livingston's scouting report to a T right there. He is strong. He's athletic at six foot seven, 220 pounds. As you said, Sean, he is just an absolute matchup nightmare. He's too big, uh, you know, he's too big and strong for, for, you know, typical college threes, but he's also too athletic, too skilled for college fours. 
there's that miss you know like there's this kind of narrative of of a tweener right like a like a terrence jones in the nba what was he in the nba because he's too you know almost too athletic and skilled for fours but you know i mean he he had his flaws at the nba level and wasn't able to find his his niche in the league but chris livingston at the college level this is exactly what you want in a player. If you're going to run this four guard lineup and you want to maximize versatility, you want to maximize athleticism and skill at all four perimeter positions. This is the way to do it. He's six, seven. He he's, he can create, you know, matchups all day long, no matter who guards him at, at this level, you're, you're going to be able to find mismatches. He's going to be able to beat you off the dribble if you're too slow and, and you know, kind of lanky. Or, you know, he can bully ball you if you're too small for him. He, he has those tendencies, and, and, and he knows how to use his body. And I think that's kind of why he's so intriguing for this staff. They have the opportunity to recruit a Dembona and Derek Lively together, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, you know, kind of the, the future of UK's recruiting efforts. Um, and – there just isn't necessarily a fit with those two together in their eyes. And I think that there's some pushback on, uh, on, you know, I think a Dembona is the main one that's kind of giving the, he he's a little bit more hesitant to play together. And I think when the staff got that hesitancy of, I don't think I want to play alongside another true big. I, if I'm going to be here, I want to be the true big. And Derek Lively, even though he loves playing on the perimeter, and he, in his mind, would have been great as that small ball four, even though he's seven freaking two, the, those two fitting together isn't, isn't what Cal wants with this. You know, you're not going to find four guards with those two together. So, Cal, I think the staff made the, the firm decision to say, all right, we're going to take one of Lively or Bona, and we're going to go with this four-guard lineup. And, Sean – like Cal said, this is the way that the, the league is going. This is the way basketball is going. I think it's a great idea. Yes. So many times when John Calipari meets with media or he has like any kind of public platform to where he speaks, he's talking, you'll get the sense he's talking about his current roster, but there's also those hidden messages to recruits. And those, that exact message you're talking about, that was signed, sealed, delivered to Chris Livingston a week ago. And then not long after that, you get what? You get the the buzz and reports of another visit to Kentucky. Memphis drops out. And then now you get a commitment date. Like you Cal's in a lot Cal's so intentional with everything he does. Now he rambles a lot and it seems like he doesn't like he just throws it to left field or throws it to right field. Jack, he's the he's one of the most intentional human beings you'll ever talk to. Everything is planned with him. And this is a stretch that they're going on right now, Jack, that this is getting Kentucky basketball back. This is how you dominate the spring with the transfer portal. You dominate the summer. And then you dominate the lead up before your team even takes the floor. Like he's dominating the headlines right now. That is so good for PR for Kentucky basketball. And think about this. They landed one top five guy from 2016. Now they've got two in seven days. And now they have the number one recruiting class in the 24 seven sports rankings. I mean, that's, they're back to being the top and Jack, they're not going to give that up. They're not giving up that top class. Yeah. It's, this is exactly what fans wanted this off season when the, you know, coaching staff changes were made and, and there was kind of this like back against the wall mentality for Cal, where he was like, I understand that I'm losing, you know, the majority of the fan base was stuck in, you know, stuck with them and understood that that things happen and seasons like this happen and you can't you can't be a national title contender every single season that you are a coach. It just it, there are outliers. It's a reason that the word outlier is an outlier. Like it's things like that happen. But there was this kind of pushback and, and some uneasiness where it was like, you know, we haven't gotten a top five prospect in, in since 2015. We haven't gotten a number one prospect since, since 2015. UK is missing that, that final blow, that final punch, that closer on this staff. And, and you know, they, they were waiting for it. They were like, you know, what we, we believe in you still, but you could just kind of feel that uneasiness and that tension with the fan base. And Cal made those moves. And so far, I mean, we're talking three top 15 prospects and, and Sky Clark, Shaden Sharp, and Chris Livingston. And then 
things are still looking up with Case and Wallace, and he's another top 10 prospect. And then Derek Lively, he's your golden, he's your other golden goose. He is the number two prospect in the class, and that would give Kentucky a number one and number two prospect in the class. And the thing, Sean, the thing that I love so much about this dream scenario for Kentucky, right, is that they are maximizing versatility where Sky Clark can play the one or the two. Shaden Sharp can play at times one through three. Case and Wallace absolutely can play one through three. Chris Livingston can play two through four. Uh, they're expecting Bryce Hopkins back for a second year, uh, and, you know, he can play three and four. And that's that's another player that, that Sean, I was told that – this wasn't just a Chris Livingston decision. They're also talking about Bryce Hopkins at that four spot, that they want him to be that small ball four. They love, love, love what he has brought to the table early uh, and what he's showing in practice in these scrimmages. And they are like, they genuinely think that he's going to have a very solid first year, but his second year, he's going to blow up and be a, a no joke, you know, not maybe not all sec type player, but, He's going he's gonna to be the goods. Like, they, they have a lot of hype in him, and, and a lot of, they've invested a lot of time and, and, and resources in him. And I, I genuinely think that that four spot is being reserved for both Chris Livingston and Bryce Hopkins. And basically the idea is when Sky Clark needs a break or, you know, Case and Wallace needs, needs some, some, bre- some rest, Chris Livingston can slide over to the three – Bryce Hopkins can come in at the four or Bryce can play the, the three and Chris Livingston can play the four. There's, there are so many mismatch, you know, way, ways to create mismatches with this lineup. There's so many, it's, it's so versatile that there's no, like this guy can only play this one position. You can't even, you can't even toy with the lineups here. All four of those guard ish forward players, they're all mix and match players. Uh, and Bryce Hopkins is the same way, and they kind of want him to be penciled in as one of those guys as well next season. So uh, that's that's I think that's what I like most about this class is that they are just so versatile. And then if you get Derek Lively, he's the same way. I mean, he's a he's a freak of nature, seven two, you know, sh- guy that can shoot on the on the perimeter. So you you can create m- mismatches all over the court with the, this lineup. The most encouraging thing is we've talked on this show since, what, spring, that Cal needed to kind of change the way he approaches the game. Was It was the game is passing Cal by. That was a big topic. Well, you see the way he's constructed this roster that we're currently about to watch. It's pieced together to play the exact same way, with Keon Brooks being the, the face-up four guy and moving primarily to that position. We've talked all about it, Jack, and we've talked and said, well, you know, Cal's put it together. Now, will he do it? That remains to be seen. But the way he's talking tells me that he's going to do it, but more so the evidence and the way he's recruiting right now. The way that he's talking to Chris Livingston about being a small ball four, that right there shows me that he is def- there's definitely change coming to the way Kentucky basketball plays offensively. He essentially said it last week, you know, four guards, four perimeter players. You got to have guard skills to play there. That doesn't mean you have to be a guard, but you better have that guard skill set. Chris Livingston has that guard skill set with that body. Play the two through the four, an improved jump shot. You get guys like Shaden Sharp, Sky Clark, whoever comes back off this team, you add a case in Wallace. If he can improve that shot, he's going to be able to knock down some shots or he's going to be able to catch and go. Like it, He's the perfect fit for what Cal is trying to do with this roster. And you're starting to see now, I don't know who's going to come back off this team. We expect some guys to come back, which I think we're to that point now where you're going to have a couple. You could be talking about a preseason number one team if this class shapes out the way that we think it's going to. Yeah, and on that note, Case and Wallace is that kind of next guy up, that next man up that everybody is kind of wondering. There's and a that's going to happen sooner, isn't it, than what it's set. And uh, so I, I was making some calls this week, you know, after the kind of finalization of Chris Livingston joining this class, I was kind of making some calls and trying to figure out who and when is going to, uh, you know, what's coming next and when it's going to happen. And every conversation I had, the expectation is that Kaysen Wallace is talking to the other recruits in this class as if he's committed and that he's, he is, very much all in on this on Kentucky and 
the the uh, the exact quote I got is some kids just want to announce on their birthday. And that kind of made me think, well, maybe he does, uh, maybe he does want to stick around and wait until November 7th and, and, you know, do it, do it on his birthday. But, you know, Chris Livingston was supposed to wait till his birthday as well. You know, he was supposed to wait until October 15th and, you know, put, he pushed that up a, an entire month. I would not be shocked if th- that same person I was talking to that said some kids just want to want to, you know, announce on their birthday, they followed it up right afterward and said, but I just, I just don't think that he's going to wait the way he's talking behind the scenes. There's just no way that he waits another two full months to, to make this decision because I, I think that Tennessee has lost a lot of, uh, a, a lot of confidence in this. I think Texas has lost a lot of confidence in this, but K- Kentucky continues to ramp up their confidence. So I, I just think the way this thing is trending, it, it does feel very Chris Livingston-y, where he has, a, he has a, an official decision date set, but it's kind of like, it, it's not if, but when he decides to kind of expedite the process a little bit and, and makes it official. I, you know, stranger things have happened. He, you know, until, like we said with Shaden, like we said with, with uh, you know Chris until he's official and until he commits things can change behind the scenes and you know when you are officially two months away from a decision like we are with with case and things could change that you but as of right now it just it it feels like we are trending toward a a case and Wallace edition sooner rather than later and and I mean Sean just think about that UK could have four top 15 prospects locked up by the early signing period yeah. signed signed on the dotted line by the start of the early signing period. And then they only have to go in all in on one more player. You, yeah. you pick and choose whoever you want. You can take, you know, a Dem bonus commitment sooner rather than later, or you can wait it out for Derek Lively, however you want to do it. That is, that, that, that is so valuable in recruiting that you only have one more guy to get and you could put all of your eggs in that basket and, you know, whatever, whatever way you decide to do that. Yeah. And three of them in the top 10. So four top 15, three top 10. Yeah. I mean, you're, yeah, they're, they're back to doing what they used to do with that elite level of talent at the top of the class. And then all the energy can shift to Derek Lively, like you said, but it can also shift to the 2023 class. So you can put most of your efforts there on the roster right now, because this class is just about wrapped up. And I mean, you can read between the lines with Casey and Wallace, our listeners should know, the moment Nick Smith Jr. canceled a visit to Kentucky and then was no longer considering Kentucky, something triggered that. Yes. He's too talented for Kentucky and, and both just to be like, nah, we're, we're going to go somewhere else. No, that, that means that something developed behind the scenes with another player at that position. Who would that be? That's Case and Wallace because you just got Shaden Sharp. Uh, no, this, this class is going to be very, very good. I said this back in the spring on the show, on other platforms. The moment Orlando Antigua came back to Kentucky was the moment that John Calipari found who he was again because that's a guy that could look him square in the eye and do something that nobody else has been able to do and say, you're not doing what you used to do. You're not your best version of yourself. We We need John Calipari that was on a vengeance and just all the time, you know, pushing and going that extra mile. You're seeing that renewed energy in the program jack just the new face it's it's a familiar face but it's a new face and i just think that it's been a shot in the arm for everyone within just the program itself on the recruiting trail you see swaggy cow coming back the the whole hallway walk and the whole wink at the end of the video all that planned out man that that's prime john calipari right there like that is that's john calipari being his best the best version of himself and I, I think that is trickling down to the staff too. Like you look at Jay Lucas and he's out in, you know, he's out in Arizona visiting Shaden Sharp and he's posting pictures of his shoes and he's like family ties. Like I got the, you know, we, we got this dude locked up and he's in Richardson, Texas, you know, Richardson, Texas uh, in the gym with Case and Wallace. And he posts the same picture with his, with his sneakers and, and, you know, kind of same thing, family ties, like, there's this this swagger uh, with the collective group now that I, I do I agree with you. I think that it's like I think those guys have kind of given 
John Calipari that much needed boost on the recruiting trail and just in terms of just, you know, program swagger and all that. But I also think that it, it's kind of been a yin and yang situation. I think that as it's given, you know, Calipari his confidence, it's also kind of trickled back down to the staff where Cal's support and that, you know, th- I, I look at this and I think, think of how Cal is trusting his staff to divide and conquer with this. He doesn't need to hold the hand of, you know, Chin Coleman or Jay Lucas or Orlando Antigua where he can just kind of say, Hey, you're going to the West coast and you're knocking out, you know, this kid, this kid, this kid, this kid today. Uh, I'm going up North to, to go, you know, visit DJ Wagner and, you know, the other kids in Camden and the other kids in the, you know, Philadelphia area, blah, blah, blah. Uh, And I need you to go down to the South, to the South, go to Texas, go to Florida. You know, they, Cal has utmost confidence and respect for his staff now where they can, he can just kind of tell them we're going to, we're going to divide and conquer and we're going to get these kids locked up. And then when need be, they're going to come together like they did for Chris Livingston. They all came together at Oak Hill and I believe it was Cal Orlando Antigua and Chin Coleman and Jay Lucas may have been there too, but I'm, I know those, those other three were, but there's just that kind of like when we need to come together and seal the deal on somebody, we can, but I trust you to lay the foundational pieces elsewhere by yourself on the recruiting trail. And there's just, there's just this new, like you said, there's this newfound energy, uh, this, this newfound growth and it's not slowing down anytime soon, Sean, this is, momentum is going to continue to go uh next step is is case and wallace and getting him officially committed and then after that it's it's the Derek lively versus adem bonan before we wrap up sean um I, i'm very curious you're john calipari you have one final scholarship to uh to, to hand out in this well i guess one more player to to accept a scholarship in this class in in it's your your front court piece uh Adem Bona or Derek Lively, who are you going all in on and who do you think is the better complimentary piece to UK's other four perimeter players? Uh, you got to go with Lively. I mean, obviously, right? Like that's the guy who's going to be right there behind Sharp when it comes to the top players in this class. You, you got to go Lively. Uh, but also at the same time, if Adem Bona comes to you and says, hey, I, I want to come, you absolutely take that, right? Wouldn't you? But I would I would go with Lively. I think if you had your choice, if you had your pick and only could take one, you take Lively because that's a dude that I mean it's a future star in my opinion. Yeah, I mean I th- I think the on court production between the two, I don't think it's going to be that different in the anticipated one year. Both of them are 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 there. Both of them are projected as one and dones. Um, I think that a Dembona is an eight. 8.8 rebound, two block per game type guy uh, at the collegiate level from from day one. And I think Derek Lively is a 10.7 rebound, four block guy at the collegiate level from day one. So it's kind of like, you know, what what pick your poison? Do you want a rim running threat? Uh, who's going to block a ton of shots and then maybe hit an occasional three or two from the perimeter? Or do you want a bully ball, dunk on your head, Montrez Harrell type? talent that's that's more you know power driven and strength driven you know are you looking for finesse or are you looking for brute strength it's like there are pros and cons with both players but infinitely more pros with both you're not going to go wrong taking commitments from either of them so I, I think UK is in a very unique situation where I think personally they are uh, all in on Derek Lively and they want to hit that home run of the, getting the number one and number two prospects in the class. I think that they see that value and what it would mean on the recruiting trail to lock up the top two players in the class. But I also do think that they have value in, you know, a Dembona as a player and they know that he can be an instant impact big in, in, at the collegiate level. So I, I think they, they are happy with the position they're in right now, Sean. I, I don't think that there's any worry about fit. A, like I think they understand that they are going to be spoiled rotten with both players no matter what. They're going to be yeah. thrilled taking commitments from either of them. It's about trying to hit the home run first with Lively, and if it doesn't – if it feels like he's going to wait until the, you know, late spring or you start getting some Duke vibes or, you know, maybe the G League comes in and you're starting to get some professional – like 
you can always revert back to your Dembo and a plan and take his commitment and you could be done by, by Thanksgiving. Uh, I think that UK is in a fantastic spot with, with both of those players and, and they're going to be able to pick their poison at this point. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And uh, we'd also don't know who comes back in this front court. You know, is, is Damian Collins, does he need a second year? Does Oscar Sheboy need another year at UK? We have no idea what the front court's going to look at, look like. But the one thing that we're going to know is that the perimeter in the back court is going to be just about done by the time we get to the spring. It'll be the front court that'll be the, the remaining piece that needs to be filled. And how many kind of depends on how many guys leave. Like, do they hit the portal again? I mean, the portal is always going to be of use for Kentucky in the spring. but Here's what you're seeing now. John Calipari in Kentucky might have this thing figured out where we always said, what happens if Kentucky figures out how to get the elite of the elite in high school and then go get the elite of the elite at a position in the portal? And then you blend it all together. That's when it gets scary. That's when you're doing something and figuring out how to do this. Like some of these coaches, some programs, Jack, are probably going to feed off the portal. Some are going to still live in the high school ranks. But I think that what you're going to get now is you're not going to have as many teams looking for reclass options. It's going to be all portal in the spring because you can go get that experienced guy that's talented to add to your roster. And I think that's going to be UK's approach is they're going to dominate the high school ranks and then look at positions of need in the portal. Yeah, I, I think that's the perfect way to put it. And it's the perfect position for UK to be in. You can get the foundation of your class and if you get a surprise departure in Xavier Wheeler or, you know, you're expecting Ty Ty Washington to leave, but, yeah. you know, you get a surprise transfer. Speaking of him, even, too, yeah. with Wheeler, I'm not saying – I mean, I know that he come to Kentucky hoping that this is his only year there and he can put himself in position to be a pro. But if there's anyone that fits, and if Scott – I mean, you're talking about you're, – they're going to need another point guard. I mean, you're not going to just go into this thing with Scott Clark running the one. They're not doing it. Yeah. Savir fits what all these other skill pieces do because <clears throat> you don't need him to score a ton of points. You just need a guy that can get the ball to these people, and I think he would fit. Yeah, I, I, I am a big – And that might be appealing player. to him, right? Yeah. That might be appealing to him when it comes down to it, when you have a Shaden Sharp, a Casey Wallace, a Chris Livingston. He might say, okay, I, I, I'd like to play a year with these guys, but it all depends on what happens with him this year. Yeah, I think I've heard some buzz that he's looking the part and that, you know, he has, he's been a leader and that he's, he's you know, the shooting is still a, a slight issue, but he's doing everything else and he's going to get his points. He's going to get his assists. He's going to run the show uh, the way that he's comfortable doing. And I think that that is going to be appealing for him, you know, after, you know, Ty Ty, he's kind of fighting right now with Ty Ty Washington as, as the guy is as the lead point guard, I'm I'm willing to bet that Ty Ty ends up as you know the the lead guy at the end of the day. He could look at this and go, you know, he's kind of secondary, uh, the secondary option right now. He could look at that and be like, you know, there's no way that that a, a freshman starts over me next season, or you know, that's that's a conversation that he's going to have with John Calipari. That I, I think it's going to be one that. You know, Cal's going to be honest with him and say, you know, you're our guy. We we love what you bring to the table. Uh, it, you know, if you want to run this back one more year and play with a bunch of damn good freshmen, by all means, let's let's make this happen. And I I, I agree. I think that he'd be a great fit for what they're bringing to the table. But he he wouldn't be ne a necessity at this point because of the portal. If if yeah. he does decide to leave, you can go get the best of the best. If you already have Derek Lively locked up or you have your, a Dembona signed, you can then go all in, push all your eggs in the transfer portal basket and get the best of the best there too. So UK is just in the such – by doing – it's kind of like the, the thing that Duke has done so well over the last couple of years where they get their foundational pieces early and then they can kind of piece their way around those top pieces uh, in the spring. They don't need to kind of have this – absolute home run in the, in the spring because they got the Paolo Bancaros of the world, uh, you know, early in the fall and they can kind of piece around them later on. I think UK has, has done even better on that front uh, with, with this class. They already have three on the cusp of getting four and now all signs are, you know, all, 
full steam ahead to the Derek Lively or Dembona train and and we'll see where it goes from here it's a a lot of reason for optimism a lot of reason to uh be excited uh for if you're a a kentucky fan chump yeah absolutely be stay plugged in right now because you don't know what's coming next absolutely well with that let's get the heck out of here and uh uh where can fans find your work sean you can find my work at gobigbluecountry.com or you can follow me on twitter at gbb country you can find me on Twitter at Jack Pilgrim KSR. Reach out to me via email at jpilgrim at kentuckysportsradio.com. With that, we'll be back next time, hopefully very, very soon, for another Jam Pack Source of State podcast. We will see you then.